Welcome back. So in this video, we're going to talk about Lachman's institutional theory. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about what is an institution. And don't worry if you find this difficult to understand. I spent my whole doctorate and probably about three years after I got out of graduate school still trying to wrap my head around institutions. I think I'm getting a little bit better right now. Institutions are not so much something like how hey, you might talk about an institution in political science like the Supreme Court versus Congress, but rather institutions are fundamental ideas that underlie patterns of human thought. For example, not the Supreme Court is an, as an institution, but rather justice as an institution. Democracy versus communism as two competing institutions. Okay? Um, certain ethical codes form kinds of institutions. In other words, these are common signposts which we use to guide us in our everyday lives. They don't really have a physical existence, although there can be ways through governance, laws, etc., that we try to embody uh, institutions. So they don't have a, it's something kind of abstract, some sort of a, a vague idea that guides your everyday life, okay? So, according to Lachman, one of the things you got to remember, and this is where it starts getting real weird, because supply and demand curves and the market functions themselves are in continuous disequilibrium state because a supply and demand function is not exactly the institution that an entrepreneur looks to. They don't necessarily think, oh, I'm going to try to reach that perfect supply and demand curve function. No, they think about high ideas. Wow, I'm going to enhance democracy. This is going to promote justice. I'm going to alleviate poverty. They think in terms of these broad ideas, and as a secondary train of thought, then they start thinking about a supply and demand curve. Right? So this really tears at the fabric of economics because you don't necessarily consider supply and demand function as the primary motivation in entrepreneurship or even economics, but rather you look to institutions for inspiration. Whew. That'll keep you laying awake at night, won't it? All right, so here's the other part. Individuals seek, especially entrepreneurs rather, they seek a coherence towards institutions, like they try to achieve that ideal democracy, and as they get kind of closer and closer to it, you have a lot of other entrepreneurs, a lot of imitators, who then enter this new field that's being created by the institutional entrepreneur, so to speak, an institutional entrepreneur. Um, so the closer you get to achieving that profit, that ideal, other imitators come in, and as the imitators come in, then it starts to generate a more complex conversation leading to divergence. So, for example, I may have a particular interpretation of democracy, and as people start to think that I've really nailed it, I totally understand it, other people will come in and copy my ideas and contribute their own, which then in turn generates some sort of a pulling effect, so we all kind of get further and further from that ideal institution that we've been talking about. So again, markets go towards this disequilibrium function because of the fact we don't fully understand institutions and the more we do understand them, the more we get towards disequilibrium. This is basically Plato's theory of forms and action. The closer we get to something, understanding something that is abstract, the further away we get from it. Wild, isn't it? And so then the next piece that we have here is how levels of analysis work with regards to imitation. Okay, so when Imitation and institutions, actually. So an entrepreneur, we normally think of somebody generating bottom-up innovation, right? Bottom to top. So at the lower levels of the economy, the entrepreneur forms, and then if they get rich enough, maybe they make it to the top. Well, this is what happens with institutional entrepreneurship. The entrepreneur starts at the bottom, then they inevitably change how institutions are interpreted by people at the top, and then those changes then come back down to the bottom, and so there's this continuous, the bottom is influencing the top, and then the top is reinforcing the bottom, and back and forth. Okay? So let me give an example of um, all of this in action. I try to give kind of easy to follow examples, like think of Facebook, right? It was very much a bottom-up enterprise in the beginning, right? It was just for students from you know, elite schools, all this other kind of stuff. And it was questioning the institution, not so much of communicate, um, 
of social media, but rather the institution of the internet or the institution of communication. So it was kind of a small firm, right? But people thought it would be kind of neat to kind of get a little bit more, more plugged in, a little bit more connected with the internet. That was kind of this coherence, right? So as Facebook kind of starts getting into that, it starts influencing, as it rises towards the top, it starts influencing other imitators that followed, Snapchat, Instagram, da 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 da, which then generates divergence because, because it becomes many different types of social media, right? And as it becomes competing interpretations of what social media is, Facebook then takes those new ideas that are coming from the bottom, those imitators, and then they incorporate them into their own platform, reinforcing the people at the bottom, but also making Facebook even larger than it was before. And this is going to be this continuous cycle. Okay. This is Lachman's institutional theory in a nutshell. In the next video, we're going to talk about Lachman's understanding of time and Lachman's understanding of methodology. Looking forward to seeing you then. And by the way, if you like these videos, please subscribe, give me a thumbs up, and if you comment down below, I normally subscribe within 24 hours. Thanks for watching.